Hi, this is Stephen from Mona Disso. Today, I'm going to talk about what we will see from Acer in 2023. I did it start off by talking about their 3D Spatial Labs, which I've always been excited about. Now, I still have these good old NVIDIA 3D Vision glasses. You know, and, you know, watching Laura Croft in Tomb Raider climbing a rope in 3D was a sight to behold. Now, Acer says there are now over 65 compatible games, you know, to play in 3D, uh, with four to five new games added every month. And for those not familiar with the Spatial Labs, this is a special screen that can show images in both 2D and stereoscopic 3D. Now this also applies if you you know you move your head from side to side, the image changes like it would in real life. Now last year they did say that they that they'll be using the Helios 300 uh, that would allow 3D gaming. So hopefully we will see that soon. Now the Triton line is you know is their high end gaming line, usually with with a thinner chassis or metal build. And less game we look. So I, I was puzzled why they didn't actually even mention this at CES. Nonetheless, they continue developing the Predator line. The Helios 300 was a notable absentee, which I also thought was quite strange. Hopefully it's not being phased out and replaced by these new Helios 16 and Helios 18. Now, both of these will use Intel and Nvidia. If you want an AMD option, you will need to go for one of the new Nitro laptops. Both will offer either an i7-13700HX or an i9-13900HX. Now these are based on desktop chips, although the 13700HX is based off Alder Lake. Now I have the 12800HX 12, in this laptop, the MSI GE77HX, and I find it definitely helps in gaming and in multitasking. Now, like my processor, the max turbo watts is 157 watts, but typically you will see a PL1 of 115 to 125 watts. Although I did hear that Razer will be reducing this to a, a measly 65 watts. Now, the amount of power that is given to these chips is very important, so make sure you do read reviews uh, because each one will not be equal. Now, I will be covering um, MSI's new laptop shortly. But I would like to point out that MSI does have an advanced BIOS where you can use an IMON tweak to trick the CPU to maintain a higher clock rate. Now, for example, this GE77HX can go from 20,000 points in Cinebench R23 to 22,600 points, allowing the i7 to perform like an i9. And I will be doing a video showing this shortly. The i7 13700HX has 16 cores and 24 threads with a max boost of 5 GHz. So it's about the same as the i9-12900HX, so performance will likely be similar. Now the i9-13900HX has 24 cores and 32 threads, max boost of 5.4 GHz, uh, so this will be a killer of a CPU. And it's based on the desktop 13900K, and we have seen how fast that is. Now, both the Helios 16 and 18 will go up to an RTX 4080 with a max graphics power of 165 watts. So that is 150 watts uh, plus 15 watts with uh, dynamic boost. Now, this is based on AD104. So the same as the desktop 4070 Ti, not the desktop 4080. But it does have 256 cores less, has eight less texture mapping units and has a slower memory. Plus, it uses about half the power, so my guess, it will be similar to a desktop 3080. Yes, you know, I know Nvidia tries to trick us again here with their naming schemes. And I'm also, and also, as I am sure you are aware, beware of Max-Q versions in smaller machines. I hope this time, uh, manufacturers denote these as lower powered Max-Q chips on the spec sheets. I am puzzled why there is no RTX 4090 option. One would think that the Helios 16 and 18 would be able to handle the cooling of both the 13th gen CPU that does use liquid metal and also the GPU. They use 5th generation Aeroblade 3D fans with rectangular heat pipes that supposedly allow for better heat transfer and higher watts. Perhaps it's because there are only 5 heat pipes and 2 of which are shared between the CPU and the GPU. There does seem to be ample air intakes underneath and also above the keyboard. Still, you will get fan control on these Helios machines and they do look really sharp with an all black matte chassis and the Predator logo on the lid is much more subtle now. 
although it is a little bit gimmicky, you can swap out the rear cooling vent faceplates. I suspect the lid and the keyboard deck are made out of metal and the base made out of plastic. Now I do like the look of the large rubber feet at the rear of the laptop. This should allow plenty of cool air, you know, to be brought in. The Helios 18 has four screen options, all of which are 16 by 10. Now I personally like 16 by 10 for gaming and also for productivity. And I did do a recent poll, 71% of people prefer 16 by 10 over 16 by 9. But I do pre appreciate why people would favor the latter for gaming. Acer does offer the new Nitro 17 that is uh, 16 by 9 as you will see shortly. Now the top panel is 2560 by 1600 mini LED and a crazy 1000 nits peak brightness. It's got 100% uh, of DCI P3 color space, 250 hertz refresh rate and advanced optimus. Now that does sound like an awesome, um, awesome display to me. You have two displays, have the same resolution and advanced optimus, but lower refresh rates of 240 hertz and 165 hertz, whilst the base model will have 1920 by 1200 resolution at 165 hertz and 100% of sRGB, but also advanced optimus. I think for a base display, that is still pretty good, as long as its brightness is at least 300 nits. The Helios 16 has three displays, all 2560 by 1600. Again, the top spec uses the 250Hz mini LED 1000 nit panel, whilst the other two are 240Hz and 165Hz, and all have advanced Optimus. And it's also good to see a 90 watt hour battery in both Helios models. Now the keyboard is mini LED per key, so I think that is nice. It's going to be nice and bright and less of a halo effect, and it also uses less power. There's also a power button to easily switch between power modes. And I think this is a must for gaming laptops. Now for storage, you do get two uh, M.2 slots and up to 32 gigabytes of DDR5 or 1800 megahertz RAM. For connectivity, there's an HDMI 2.1 and two Thunderbolt 4 ports that support power delivery around the back. You also have a customizable light bar around the back that runs along the top of the rear vents. There are two USB Type A's on the right, whilst on the left you have the RJ45, a third USB Type A, micro SD card reader and a combo headphone mic jack. I would much have preferred to see a full sized SD card reader. Now there was a time when the Helios laptop looked too gamery and also a little bit cheap. Now it's looking much sharper and I do like it. As for the pricing. Um, the Helios 16 will be available in North America in March, uh, starting at $1,650. I suspect that will be with the i7 and the RTX 4050. In uh, EMEA, it will be available in February, starting at €2,400. Now, the Helios 18 will be available one month later in North America in April, starting at $1,700, and EMEA in March, starting at €2,500. Now, if you do want to save some money, then go for the Nitro 16 or the Nitro 17. They are both available with an Intel or AMD CPU. For Intel, you get a 13th Gen i5 or i7 up to an HX. For AMD, you can get a Ryzen 9, Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 5, the 7045 series, and the latest RTX 4000 GPUs. I suspect actually only going up to the RTX 4070 at best really so it won't compete with the Helios line. Now these new Ryzen CPUs will be no slouch either. I suspect the Nitro will go up to the Ryzen 9 7845 HX with 12 cores and 24 threads boosting up to 5.2 GHz. Having more performance cores than Intel may appeal to some gamers. The 17 inch will be the only model with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio and has an 81% screen to body ratio. There are two panel options, uh, Full HD 144Hz or 165Hz and QHD at 165Hz. Both have a 3 millisecond response time and advanced optimus. Now again, the CPU uses liquid metal and unlike the Helios, you do get faster DDR5 5600MHz RAM up to 32GB. Like the Helios, you get two M.2 slots, but unlike the Helios, you do not get uh, RAID 0 as an option. The Nitro 16 has a 16 by 10 aspect ratio and 84% screen to body ratio. 
You can either have uh, 1920 by 1200 165 hertz or 2560 by 1600 165 hertz panel. Again with Advanced Optimus, and both have 100% of sRGB. Now the same CPU and GPU options uh, as the 17 inch are available on the 16 inch. Both have a four zone RGB keyboard and a large trackpad measuring 125 millimeters long. Not sure about you, I'm not a huge fan of large trackpads. They're much easier to activate inadvertently. The chassis is all black matte plastic. The lid looks a bit gamey with an N logo that looks like a lightning bolt with some color motifs on the sides. You do get some air intakes above the keyboard as well as the usual nitro sensor button to activate the power modes, alter fan speed, change key lighting, and look at thermals. The AWSD and arrow keys are highlighted with a white border. On the left is the RJ45, USB Type-A, micro SD card reader and combo head from MicJack. And on the right are two USB Type-A's and around the back is the HDMI 2.1 and two USB-C ports supporting DisplayPort and power delivery. The Nitro 16 is available in North America in May for starting at $1150. I suspect that will have the Ryzen 5 7645HX and the RTX 4050. Or in EMEA, also in May, starting at €1,500. Euros. The Nitro 17 is available in North America in May, starting at $1,200 for the same Ryzen 5 and RTX 4050. Or in EMEA in May, starting at €1,600. Euros. I think for those just wanting a no-thrills gaming laptop with good hardware, then the Nitro line looks like a no-brainer to me. Now, there's no mention uh, on battery size, but these Ryzen chips will be very efficient. So if battery life is a key thing for you, then these are a good option. And I also like that even the base model gets Advanced Optimus. Now all the laptops I have tested with Advanced Optimus work great. It does seamlessly switch between the dedicated GPU and Optimus uh, without, you know, without a reboot and you get G-Sync. So now if you're after something perhaps a little bit smaller and still powerful, you may want to opt for say the Asus Swift 14 Go. It is a 14 inch laptop with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. Now the bezels are really thin, 4.1 millimeters, so you get a 90% screen to body ratio. There are two panels. The 90 Hz OLED has a resolution of 2880 by 1800. It is Visa Display HDR500 certified with 100% of DCI-P3. Now OLEDs have lightning fast response times and infinite contrast. The second panel is IPS at 2240 by 1400 resolution. OLEDs typically have worse battery life, but the Swift Go 14 supposedly gets nine and a half hours, which is pretty decent. Now there will be an AMD model using the Ryzen 7035 CPUs. So a Ryzen 3 7335U, a Ryzen 5 7535U, or a Ryzen 7 7735U using integrated Radeon graphics. Now the body is anodized uh, aluminum available in three different colors. It's only 14.9 millimeters thick and weighs 1.2 kilograms or 2.8 pounds. Now there will also be an Intel model using 13th gen H processors and Intel Unison allowing you to easily connect your phone to the laptop for the for file transfers, phone calls and messaging. I like how it has a 1440p webcam with noise reduction. Now, if you do need a larger screen they will be offering a 16 inch version. Now, if you do want a dedicated GPU and a 14-inch screen, Acer will have the Swift X14. This is powered with the Intel 13th Gen H series and RTX 4050, with studio drivers installed. And this could be an ideal laptop for creators. It has a 2.8K OLED with a fast 120Hz refresh rate and 100% of DCI P3. Pricing for the Swift 16 Go starts at $800 and is available in June. The Swift 14 Go starts at $850 and is available in February. And the Swift X14 will start at $1,100 and will be available in April. So there you have it. I think Acer has some exciting machines coming out. Now let me know which ones you are most excited to see and I'll see if I can get them to test. Thanks for watching. Bye now.